content is for entertainment only. Listener discretion and responsibility apply. The network is not liable for listener actions or consequences. Hello, 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 my friends in Sasquatch land. Monday night once again, and Discover Sasquatch is back in the Untold Radio Network studio. I am your host tonight, the OG, Chris Reinhardt. Welcome one and all. We have another great show for you tonight. We will not disappoint. We have Mr. Kumbo himself in the back room as we speak, Mr. Tim Baker. Um, very excited to have this man with us tonight. Um, I'm pretty excited to hear the topic that we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, it's going to be a really good show. And there's a running bet if we can keep this show in an hour. Uh, so I, I got inside track talking to Tim backstage, and uh, we're going to take everybody's money on that. So, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I'd like to say hello to everybody before we get going. Uh, Boots on the ground with Barb is with us. Richard Jr., how are you doing tonight, sir? Mr. Spencer Jameson's with us. Uh, the Squatch Father himself and Alfred Santariga is with us. David Hughes is with us. Patrick Nobel is with us. Everybody's pouring in. This is going to be a great show. Miss Diane Fowler is with us. Mr. David Hughes. Hello, one and all. Jimmy Osmer. Hello, Jimmy Osmer. George White. Unacknowledged and unknown. Good evening. Mr. Flat Rock is with us tonight, too. So everybody's coming in. Everybody's coming in. And uh, I'm glad to see it. Hello, one and all. I hope you all had a great week last week. I hope uh, Mr. John Lamb is now with us, and uh, and I had a great weekend. And uh, uh, let's start off the week with with uh, Discover Sasquatch and Mr. Tim Kumbo Baker. So, without any further ado, here he is, Mr. Tim Baker. <laughs> Hello, my friend. Howdy. Proud How to be doing? here. Yeah. Thank you for being, uh, thank you for taking time on your Monday night with us here at Discover Sasquatch and everybody in the chat's very happy that you're here. Uh, people are plowing in one after the other, one after the other. Mr. Greg House is here with us too. So everybody's here, my friend. Um, so thank you for being here. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, I like to say that. Say hi to everybody and uh, and uh, all my friends, all my booger hunting buddies that are here. Glad y'all are here, uh, and especially Mr. Greg Howes, who's who's uh, recovering from some pretty major surgery uh, last week for last, and he's uh, he's still a hurting unit right now. But I'm glad to That's see him in here. Yeah, that's pretty crazy how they they had to go into his hip to fix his ankle. I mean, that's just oh, right. You know, in yeah. one part to fix another part. Yeah. But, uh, well, he ain't telling you what he did, what they did to his head. You know. So. <laughs> <laughs> we kept him in our prayers here at Discover Sasquatch. That's yeah. for sure. And uh, yeah, sir. He's on, glad that he's on and, the uh, road to recovery. So before yeah. we get started tonight, why don't you? Tell everybody a little bit about yourself, how you got, you know, how you got started in the in the Bigfoot world, and let everybody know how long you've been doing it. And then I got a, another question Alrighty. for you before we go any further. All righty. Well, um, I grew up up until the fifth grade, uh, living in a house about uh, three hundred yards south of here, and where I'm sitting right now, and I'm out on my farm, uh, which is. Uh, in Northwest Alabama. And um, I saw my first Bigfoot when I was four years old, right outside my bedroom window. Scared me half to death. Um, I heard it out there walking around on the gravel. And I went and looked out the window. And there, I'm talking about raised up the screen and stuck my head out looking around. And, and there it was standing there. Uh, with his back up against the house looking at me. And I know now that it was a juvenile, but I went running and screaming into my parents' bedroom. And a telling thing was that um, they didn't say, oh, it's just, you're just imagining things, just going back to bed, it'll be all right. No, my dad jumped up out of the bed, 
jumped into his shoes and into his slippers and grabbed his shotgun and his big flashlight and goes running out after it and yelled at my mom, get the kids and, and lock yourselves in the bathroom. And uh, so the only kid at that time was my, my little sister, and she was an infant then. So mama grabbed her out of the crib. And we ran in the bathroom and had us, she had us sit down in the corner, and she, she sat down, backed up to us, and pulled her pistol out, her thirty eight, and she has it drawn, pointed at the bathroom door, which she had locked as we went in. And uh, after a bit, my dad came back in, and, and uh, you know, he, he, uh, first question my mama asked him was uh and he says no but i heard it beating feet up towards the and he was talking about up towards the south uh northeast corner of the field which literally where he said it went is literally like 35 40 yards from my sitting and to this day that's still a major travel route for him through here and um so I already knew that they existed even before that because I'd heard them and stuff. And, you know, I'd asked my dad, my grandpa and stuff what they were. And and uh, they called them catamounts back then, of course, um, or boogers and stuff like that. But the word Bigfoot, this is in 1958, the word Bigfoot hadn't even been invented. So I grew up around them and I called my first one to me when I was uh, 12 years old, almost 13 years old, back in 1968. And uh, my dad and I were out fishing down in a place on the Tennessee River called uh, out west here called Coffee Slough. And we were up in the slough fishing and heard one up near the head of the slough holler. And I looked at my dad and he looked at me and he says, yep. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm going to try to call it. He said, go ahead. And so I did. And it was pretty sorry. And and uh, and so I tried again and, and it, it actually came to us and we ended up having to get out of there. Uh, my dad was afraid he was going to come out in water after us because it was it was it was aggravated, very aggravated when it was coming in. So anyway, um, I grew up knowing about them, and we had a number of incidents that happened out here on the farm. And basically, anybody that spent much time out here on the farm has had an, had an encounter with them of one kind or another, and including uh, my brother-in-law who. Uh, I worked for the government for, for 14 years and I was a, um, ended up as a senior test engineer for working for, for NASA and for the army missile command. And my sister was a senior engineer with NASA. My brother-in-law was, was a level or two above that. I think he was like a deputy director or an assistant direct deputy director with NASA. And, and I got a brother that still works for the government. I got another brother that was a, um, was in the air force and he was a, nuclear warhead technician on intercontinental ballistic missiles. And um, I have a nephew that still works for the, the missile command. Um, like I said, I, my grandfather used to work on the arsenal um, building stuff for the government. But, um, and my dad started out in college in aeronautical engineering, ended up uh, getting his degree in ag engineering but um, uh, and he ended up being flying in bombers during World War II, and so you know I grew up in a family that kind of family you wouldn't think that would be in, in, have an interest in Bigfoot, but we all knew they existed, and and we pretty much talked about them. You know, sometimes talked about them openly. Learned a lot about them from my grandmother and and from my great grandmother. Um. And um, I started researching them very seriously in about 1975, not long after I met a who became one of my best friends in the world, a guy named Jim Hart. We called him Bubba or Bubba Gump. And um, and we met when we were in college and, um, and found out that his mother was from down near where Greg, uh, Greg Howes is from. And that place is, is crawling with Bigfoot. And uh, so Jim had always had a, an interest in him. And then when he found out that, that, I, that I started telling him about him, having them out here on the farm. So we started coming out here and researching them and, you know, trying to, trying to make contact with them. Uh, and anyway, Jim and I researched them together for, uh, you know, for, for decades. 
And, uh, but I went to work for the government in 1980 and did a lot of traveling while I worked for the government. And I started, um, well, I realized that, um, uncle Sam owned me from eight to five. After that, I was on my own time. So, uh, I was on a lot of, in a lot of interesting places. Didn't take me long to figure out that there are a lot of Bigfoot on government installations of all kinds. I mean, a lot of them. So it took me a little while, but I figured out the right people to talk to on these installations and, and, um, started, you know, researching a whole lot more anyway. Um, I've researched and I'm talking about in the woods, feet on the ground, you know, poking around out there in, in a 40 out of 50 states. Um, the states that I haven't researched in are uh, Alaska, Hawaii, Oregon, um, uh, Michigan, uh, Connecticut, and uh, South Carolina, believe it or not. I think those are the I think those are seven states. Well, you're going to have to um, come. You're going to have to come up here to Connecticut and I'll take you out so you can get, you can put this under in your belt <laughs> notch too. Yeah. <laughs> and I've driven through Connecticut several times, but I just never, never researched. I, I've been close right over there in, in Rhode Island, believe it or not. And you know, believe it or not, there's a few, few uh, Bigfoot sightings in Rhode Island of all things. Right. But anyway, so uh, I've been doing this seriously for for forty for forty nine years, and um, and sort of unofficially, just uh, I'm trying to poke around on my own, just here locally, um, for about uh, another seven years beyond that, and so and I took my first written report from somebody that had 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 a sighting um, about five or six miles east of here, where I'm sitting. And I wrote it up as a Bigfoot report and a uh, sighting report. And then um, uh, about eight years later, I figured out that, uh, no, excuse me, six years later, I, f I figured out that dog that there was a thing out there that we call dog man now. And that those first three or two or three reports that I'd written up were all dog man sighting reports. And that they were probably dogman reports. So I went back and found some of those people and re-interviewed them. And it turned out they, my first reports that I took were, were dogman sightings. Uh, uh, so I often say uh, any any researcher that's that's worth a flip has got to be willing to go back and review his his previous research and his previous uh, ideas, and and be willing to change his conclusions based on new knowledge. Um, you know, you can't just, uh, um, you know, make your mind up that something's the way it is and, and never, and then, ha then just shut your mind off. That's not a, that's not a decent researcher in any field of endeavor. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter what you're doing, but well, I agree as far as you. how I got the name, Coon, yeah, as far as how I got the name Coonbo back, um, I used to be a member of a hunting club, a deer hunting club and a well, deer in Turkey. And, uh, we, we were just a bunch, bunch of young guys and we piled in down there to deer camp uh, one Sunday morning and all the, uh, the OGs, <laughs> the, all the old guys had already left uh, that, that, that the afternoon before. So just some of us young guys and we were all broke and didn't have any money. And we got to looking around for something to eat in the, um, in the camp, didn't find anything. So we said, all right, whoever, kills anything that's edible, bring it home and we'll, we'll eat it. So I got back and somebody said, um, uh, I, I, I hadn't gotten anything and anything. One of the guys said, yeah, I killed an old hen Turkey and it's in there in a pot. I've already got it parboiled and everything. And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I had found some chili fix. I said, I'll make chili out of it. So I go in there and, uh, long story short, I looked at it. I knew it wasn't a turkey, but I didn't know what it was. But the meat looked okay. So I went ahead and it was already parboiled. I went ahead and deboned it and chopped the meat all up, and browned it, and made me a big old pot of chili. And uh, and I noticed 
bunch of laughing and cutting up and carrying on out in the parking lot and you know, out in front of the camp, but that was pretty normal. And um, by the time I got done and I'd hollered at them to come on in and eat, nobody would come in and eat. And I heard a car pull up as our camp cook. He walks in, he walks by and he says, uh, he walked in, he says, Tim, you ever eaten coon before? And I said, yeah, I've had it in some stew over in Arkansas at the duck camp. He said, well, it ain't been that long ago. That's what you're eating right now. I said, well, I, I said, okay, it's pretty good. You want some? No, no, no. I couldn't get anybody to have it. So I ended up eating that whole big pot of stew myself over the next day or so. So I got the name Coon. So my, my nickname was Coon for years. And then when I was stationed out of White Sands Missile Range for a while, uh, I got involved in shooting um, – long range, you know, 600, 600 meter or 600 yard military rifle matches. And I bought a, I bought an FA, FN FAL uh, semi-automatic match rifle, which that was uh, back at the time, the uh, FN FAL was the um, uh, main battle rifle of most of our NATO allies. And it, it shoots the 308 cartridge. And I enjoyed shooting it and it was accurate enough. I found a sniper scope mount for it put on it and I bought a scope to put on it. I decided I was going to take it deer hunting next time I was back in Alabama. So that's what it did. Showed up down to camp with it. And, and, uh, <laughs> I had a rule. You had to jack your bolt open and set your, and, you know, improve, and take the magazine out of it and set it in the, in a rack. And, uh, you know, just to show that it was unloading everything. The old hunt master walked in saw that rifle there. Who brought that blankety blank blank Rambo rifle down here? And uh, I said, I did. What are you going to do with that? I'm going to kill deer with it. So I went out the next day and killed two deer with it. So they started calling me Rambo Coon and then somebody chopped it to the Coon Bow. So it stunk. So that's so how I got to know. Can't yeah, combine two nicknames into one. So yeah. All right, yeah. I was always I was always curious about that, and I asked you pre yeah. pre show, and you said we'd wait for the show to come. Yeah. So before we press on, I'd like to just dive into a little bit of your back in your child. How how long was your activity on on the farm before you even had your interaction? Was it years before that? I suppose decades, hundreds of years. There's a there's a story that happened. Um, we have a holla here on the farm called No Head Holla. There's a story that the way it got its name was in the 1920s. Some of the earliest white settlers, early white settlers here, two brothers settled over there in No Head Hollow. And um, somebody had not seen them for a while. And um, they, um, somebody went in there looking for them and found both of them beheaded. There, and, and it wasn't just that their head was chopped off. Their heads were yanked off. It was very clear that their heads had been yanked off. One of them, they never found the head. The other one, they did. And, that, and that's the way the place got the name No Head Holla. So that was in the 1820s. I've looked on, I've been able to find um, old maps and stuff that went back into the, uh, into the 1830s. And No Head Holla is on the map. And then if you follow it out to the southeast, and you go up and over a real low ridge, it goes down into a place called Booger Bottoms. And boogers are one of the you know, main names for them that we've had around here. In fact, I grew up calling them boogers. And, uh, and that's on maps. I mean, you can, you can pull it up and see it on, uh, on Google Maps. So, um, you know, they, uh, the, the history goes back as long as, uh, you know, people have been in the area. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, and then, you know, my, I have a, I had a great grandmother that was either full or half Cherokee. And, you know, she had a lot of, a lot of stories that went back. Um, in fact, she saw one back in the 1800s when she was uh, about 16 years old up in Watauga County, North Carolina, uh, near a place that's now called, um, seven devils and uh there's a ski resort up there now but back in the time it was just wilderness and so you know they've they've been here forever as long as any 
you know, humans have been in the area. So right. I know that, um, yeah. Yeah, so, even before, I mean, they, there's, you can't, history, can only, history can only be written so far back about them. Um, right. They could have been around since the beginning of time, for all we know, correct? Well, I, I've seen a... Uh, I've seen petroglyphs that clearly depict Bigfoot that they say are, uh, uh, I saw that the ranger said it was like 17,000 years old. And, uh, and it was, it was obviously a Bigfoot. So, uh, you know, they can, they can sort of figure out how old petroglyphs are by how much, how much patina they have on them. Um, uh, so, uh, you know that they, they had pretty neat how they do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've recently gotten in, in touch with Scott Walter about a a project that I got going on up here, and he is a a forensic geologist, and he just like you said, yeah. they can look at stones and date things and tell you that if it was underwater, it's it's pretty it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, our conversation on Saturday. I personally, and I'm not afraid to admit it, I never really looked into the Nephilim, the fallen ones. I've never researched it. I, I don't know if I, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've just, I've only been doing this for eight years. I haven't been doing it for 49 mm -hmm. years. So yeah. I'm a newbie to the subject and I like to listen to all things. You know, I listen to everybody. I'll listen mm -hmm. to them. If I don't, I don't have to agree with everybody. I still not going to put them mm -hmm. down. I'm not going to say this and that, but the Nephilim thing intrigued me when you were talking about it and the way you, you went about it and explained mm -hmm. things to me. And uh, uh, I would really like to tap into a little bit about that tonight before uh, the end of the show. And we can, we can start it now if you'd like. And uh, Yeah, well, let's do it because uh, we got about, we ain't got but about another 35, 40 minutes. So, right. oh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, it's going to be the Reader's Digest version, but uh, about 15 years ago, 15, 16 years ago, a uh, researcher and I that um, that he he lives up in Kentucky, not too far from um, in between the lakes, and we've known each other since back in the uh, early 2000s. We got to talking about um, somehow we came up on the subject of Nephilim, and. Um, he had been doing some scripture studies and um, and he had some ideas about it. And I think we had talked maybe in the past that I took some, I took some uh, old Testament and new Testament classes in college. And I don't remember the exact details of how we got off on it, but anyway, we were sort of independently we'd get together and talk about studying these scriptures, trying to figure out if Bigfoot were connected to Nephilim. And this is, this is before anybody else was talking about it. This was 15, 16 years ago. And based on what I was finding out and what he was finding out, and we were going back all the way, we were studying ancient Greek, ancient Hebrew, the Buddha, we were studying Aramaic. Uh, I had even tried to, to do some some figuring with, uh, with cuneiform stuff because I had been in, interested in that since I was a kid. And um, uh, <laughs> there you go, Larry. But um, anyway, um, I, I, um, the more we dug into it, the more, the more interested that I got and uh, both of us got. We found, actually, it was my buddy that, that first found this scripture and showed it to me. We found some uh, some scripture, and it might have been in one of the non canonical books, but uh, where that it said that Nephilim are compelled to respond to the voice of God, and he said, he said I thought he said I've read this thing half a dozen times, and I thought the voice of God was God's voice, you know, words coming out of his out of his mouth, or that he made appear out of the air or whatever. But he said, no, it's actually, I think it's a thing. So I got to looking at it. He wanted me to look at it too. And I got to look at it and I agreed it was a thing. Well, we started digging into it deeper. I um, I ended up having, a, I hunted down a Jewish mystic up in upstate New York that was an 
a uh, an expert in the Aramaic texts and the Proto Hebrew texts, and was I also familiar with some of the other things, some of the early Ethiopian and and uh, and ancient Greek. He agreed. He said yes. He said the voice of God definitely is a thing. He wouldn't tell me what it was though, but he gave me enough little hints that over about the next year and a year or so, I figured out what it was, what the voice of God was, that it was a a, cert, a very specific and certain type of a shofar, which is a Jewish ceremonial horn. And uh, we don't have enough time to get into it here, but um, exact, the exact thing about it. So then I said, all right, if I can find one of these, then um, I can test it and see if what they'll do if I if I can blow the thing. But it took me quite a while to find one. I mean, it was a multi-year deal of finding one that I could afford. I found some online, but they were prohibitively, prohibitively expensive. I finally, by the grace of God, stumbled across one in an old antique store. And I started learning how to try to blow it. It was exceedingly difficult to blow. And I finally got it where I can make make some you know some sounds out of it. And so I got a hold of the mystic again. No, you're not doing it right. And he explained to me what I was looking for. And exactly the, the scales that you could do with the thing. And my God, it was I actually trying to learn to blow the thing. I was would actually get blood blister on my lips. I mean, it was that bad. One day I had just given up and I would just try to just throw the thing down and I and I just went, you know, just like that, just just out of frustration. And I hit the note. I hit one. There's only two notes that the thing makes that that the Nephilim will respond to, according to this mystic. I knew it though the second I blew it. Absolutely, positively. Um, and there's a couple of folks that are in here now that have been with me when I've blown it correctly, and they've seen the results of it. Uh, Greg's seen it, and I think I saw Mary Fabian in here. She she was with me one time when I when I blew it. Um, but uh, anyway, playing with it there at my house, I ended up accidentally calling one up onto my back deck that came up on the back deck and looked in the window at us scared scared us half to death i didn't know for sure that that's why it came so i got with a uh, i got with some friends of mine that i'd been researching with up in iowa and we went we went up to an area that i'd had great results from in the past and we went to one place and blew, and blew it and got no response whatsoever. Went to another place about four miles away. Took me about 15, 20 minutes to hit the right note, but I did. When I did, it was like the woods had been dead silent. No nothing. No coyotes, no frogs, no nothing. When I hit the right note, it was like you flipped the switch. All of a sudden, the, the woods just went crazy. Booger started screaming and yelling from three different directions. And coyotes started going crazy, barking and everything. And I tried and I managed to hit. Uh, I tried it again and I managed to, for the first time, roll over from the first note right into the second note. And my God, all of a sudden we realized that we had three groups of boogers coming in on us like like ra runaway rabid bulldozers coming through the woods, screaming, tearing over the stuff from three different directions. And what was really crazy, this big group of coyotes, we're talking about about a, a dozen and a half, uh, you know, somewhere 15 to a dozen and a half, 15 to 18 coyotes came out of the woods into the road that we were on and were all hunkered down and had their tails between their legs and were whining. They came up the road to us 
and laid down in front of us. And I'm talking about the closest ones were, you know, six feet in front of my truck, you know, and, and six, eight feet um, from us. And the furthest one might have been less than 20 feet from us. And they just laid down, they hunkered down, and and they they turned their back on us, and they were looking back down the road and up into the woods where these things were coming from. And that it gives me chili bumps just telling this story. I mean, it it I've never had never seen anything like that before, and I had heard people say that. Well, they'd been around around Bigfoot and you know trying to call them or something, and the Bigfoot would be coming in, and that coyotes would run out of the woods or run past them and stuff. But these came to us, and they were looking for protection. It was very obvious what they wanted. They wanted us to protect them. And there were there were four of us there, and we are we are utterly astounded. What happened though? The the Bigfoot came in loud and fast until they got where they could close enough that they could see us. Once they saw us, they stopped. And they just stood there. And they didn't all get there right at the exact same time. Now, this is what was crazy, because my experience in the past had been, you get you get two, two alpha males that close together, they're going to fight. You know, they're going to yell at each other or do something. You know, they're going to have some kind of territorial displays. There was none of that. They didn't even pay attention to each other at all, to the other troops. When I say the troop, I mean the whole family unit. I'm talking about the big alphas, the female, the juvies, the 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 the, the, the young adults, the, the the beta males and stuff, the whole group. We had three of, three of these groups out there, no further away than the furthest one wasn't 40 yards from us. Most of them were less than that. You know, they were they were you know, 20 to 30 yards away. And, and they, they just stopped and they're standing there and, you know, we've got a couple of thermals going and, and we're looking around and we're not having, absolutely not believing what we're seeing, but they're all just looking at us. And, um, I, I you know, what are they doing? What do they want? You know, you know, what's going on? And the coyotes are still just, they're just hunkered down, being dead quiet, not moving a muscle. The coyotes in the road in front of us. After about 30 minutes, one of the one big alphas turn and just starts walking off back in the woods. And then one after another, the rest of his group followed him. And over the next 15 minutes, the rest, the other ones started just walking away. So after about 45 minutes, they're all gone. And we're looking with our thermals and stuff, and, yeah, they're gone. Well, the coyotes are still laying there in the road, and eventually they got to turn and they got to turn back and look at, looking at us, you know. And about another five minutes, they stood up and looked around and and trot off down the road. They will trot, off, trot down the road about, about 60, 70 yards and then just jumped across the ditch and up in the woods they went. And we're all standing there with our mouths hanging open, wondering what in the world just happened. So we went to another place that night and called over on the Mississippi River. And um, we had we had three groups come that time. And this time, two of the groups had to wade through water to get close to us, had to wade through waist, waist deep on them. It would have been, you know, neck deep on us to get close to us. And... Um, and one of them came up behind us up on top of the levee. And we never heard now we never heard that one coming. And one of the guys, I'm standing there and he bumps me on the shoulder and he and he does like this, you know, you know like it. And I looked up and right up on top of the levee, six feet above my head, there's a booger standing there. A big one, a big alpha male. I'm talking about one of these big type one. Uh, you know, like Patty's husband. That dude probably weighed 1,200 pounds, four foot wide across the shoulders. Big old, I mean, his toe, his toes were a foot above our head. And he was just standing there glowering down us. He could have spit on us. He could have peed on us. He could have dropped a rock on our head. 
I mean, if, if he wanted us, he had us. And we stepped out away from, uh, away from the heavy away. Uh oh, I've locked up. And, um, we stepped out from the levee a ways. Can y'all still hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. All right. Well, then I'll, I'll keep I'll keep talking. And um, but we stepped out from the levee a ways, and we turned around, and I looked up at him, and I'm so there's a couple of us stayed watching the one that was up on the levee, and a couple of other guys, you know, they kept watching the ones that were out there on the on the uh, mud bank or the sand. Well, I don't know if it was a mud bank or a sand sandbar. And, um, anyway, um, we, uh, we, we kept our eyes on them and the same thing happened as before. They hung around for about 30 minutes, you know, 25, 30 minutes and then started walking away. Now the big one that was up on top of the, uh, the levee, when he walked away, he just walked back into the woods, into the brush and stuff about maybe 25, 30 yards. We couldn't. We couldn't uh, see him anymore, but we could hear him. We knew he was in there. Um, uh, we we knew he was in there. The other ones that were out in the water, you know, they waded all the way back to the islands that they had come off of. They had come off of islands out in the Mississippi River. But again, it was about 45 minutes before they were all gone. Now, since then, I've, I've blown it in, blown it in Iowa. Um, Missouri, Arkansas, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Texas. Um, I don't think I've blown it in Georgia. I've done it in, in Georgia. Um, for sure, those states. And everywhere I've blown it, we've had the same kind of results. So then... I um I began to wonder what were they coming up here? It was obvious that that they were expecting something from me, and I didn't know what they wanted. Uh, do you want me to go out and come back in real quick? Yeah, I was gonna. I was waiting until you take. Uh, yeah, try All that. Right. Real quick. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna. All right, so. Mr. Baker's on a hot spot out there where he's at and uh, <clears throat> got a little technical difficulties, but he'll be back. So we were talking about the frequency thing the other day when we were starting and then he, and I was telling him what we had going on here. And then he started telling me about the show far. And um, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty, all right, here he comes back. We'll let him continue. Nope. Uh oh. Hopefully, you can get back. Yes. Okay. There you are. There you are. All right. All right. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're good, and you're moving. All right. Now, um, so anyway, we figured out that they were that they were wanting something, and so I went back to study the scriptures and stuff and digging deeper. And one of the things I found, one of the first things I found was Revelations chapter 6, verse 8. Um, I'm going to read 7 also because it's a weird thing here. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. Now, interesting thing. When I read that, that really hit me. We've been learning some of their language. And one of the phrases that we have learned, and I'm not going to share it with y'all here. I'm sorry. But uh, one of the phrases that we've learned is come and see. And, and this is a phrase that they've used over a wide area. Of the, we've heard them say this over the wide area of the southeast. But anyway, so here we go. Verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. Now, interesting thing about the word pale, that can be, there's three different ways according to which which ancient text that you're reading that that can be interpreted. One is that it's, that it is actually a pale color. The other one is that it's a sick horse. Another one is that it's a green horse. The word is, can also be 
translated as, as green. And I think it's green in the ancient Greek, if I remember correctly, or maybe Hebrew, early Hebrew. Um, but um, anyway, and all the, the green, I think about this green, this uh, fakey green movement that we're going through now. And um, people are buying all these electric vehicles thinking they're green and they're saving the earth, which they're actually a lot worse because of the, the batteries and all the, the, you know, like a Toyota Prius or, and, um, and, um, and, and uh, what's the other ones? The Teslas. Before they ever hit the showroom floors, they've got a greater carbon footprint than a dead gun 3500 or F-350 Ford with a Super Duty diesel with a, you know, hot rod chip in it with 350,000 miles on it. You know, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, a big, somebody's big old truck will never make a big, as big a carbon footprint as one of these Priuses or Teslas do before they ever hit the, hit the showroom floor. And that's because of the batteries and all the, the, uh, terrible stuff in the batteries. But, you know, if you really get to digging a lot of this green stuff, you know, some of it's good, but a lot of it just is a bunch of hooey. But anyway, that's enough politicking. So anyway, and I looked and behold a pale horse and the name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, when I first read that, I thought, oh my God, they're talking about the Nephilim. So I've, I have proven with the shofar, I have proven that Bigfoot have some Nephilim blood in them because in the Bible, it says that the Nephilim are compelled to respond to the voice of God. And I, blew the voice of God. I had the voice of God and it called them in. They came in everywhere. I've tried this. If I don't care for two miles away, if they hear it, they come. So that proved without a shadow of a doubt to me that Bigfoot have some percentage of Nephilim, Nephilim blood in them. And um, Tim, before yeah, you go further, not, you not Nephilim, but... yeah, you're still there. Go ahead. Yeah. You want to explain to them about the, the other horns before and the, the names of the other shofars before we move on so they know how the voice, how the one that you're using got the voice of God name? Or is that well, something you don't they, want to um, Well, I can tell you. If okay. you look in a really, really old Bible, a Bible that was printed in the 1500s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, Seven, some 1700s and a very, very few, very early 1800s. And you look at what they call the illuminated, the illuminations, which is their idea, what they called a, a, um, a picture or, or an illustration back then. And you look at the horns that the angels blow, especially look up, a, find a picture of what the angels are blowing up in the air that are around the walls of Jericho, when the Israelites are marching around it on the ground, look at what the angels are blowing that are up in the air. And the, the Israelites are blowing shofars made out of goat horns and ibex horns. The angels are blowing, are blowing shofars made from kudu horns. Now, if you find one that shows a straight trumpet, ain't wrong. That ain't, that ain't it. That ain't what they used. Um, you got to go back to the, to the old stuff. Um, and I, I actually, you know, I actually talked with some of these Jewish scholars and verified that that is true, that, that, that that's the correct, that that is the voice of God, that very specific type of shofar that the, that, that are shown that the angels know. And they are, they do use some of these in some ceremonies in the, uh, in synagogues, but they don't blow them at the, at the notes that, that will summons the Nephilim. So uh, there, like I said, there, you can, you can, you can blow a whole lot of different notes on these things, but there's only two that will summons the Nephilim. Um, so anyway, like I said, there you, there's three that you can find. You can find the mo most common one is the goat horn shofar, the um, 
and then there's the ibex horn shofar, and then there's a kudu horn shofar. And the voice of God is the kudu horn shofar. Now, we, um, and uh, like Greg says, I do not recommend, I have quit messing with mine because I realized I was getting into something that I shouldn't be messing with. So mine is in the closet and I haven't used it in a while. And I'm not planning on using it anytime. Um, so I got to, you know, after that scripture, they're talking about the, the beasts of the earth. Well, I got to thinking, well, I wonder if, if this means that, that they're I'm blowing it and they're coming to us and they're expecting me to give them, you know, say sick them. And all of a sudden that all the boogers are going to start killing out a fourth of the population of the earth. No, that's not. Um, and we didn't get to get into this, Chris, very much. What I, I, I went back and I got to remembering things that my great grandmother said and things that I have heard from other natives and things that I've read in other cultures around the world concerning Bigfoot and, and what they do. And they are not, uh, they're not, these, these boogers are not going to be attacking us. This Now, this is Tim Baker speaking, but this is based on, on my knowledge of, you know, of, of talking to, uh, to people and, you know, to, to Native Americans, including my great grandmother and of people out of multiple tribes and talking to uh, biblical scholars and folks that have had a, uh, uh, my buddy Troy Allen has also been working with me studying this as well. He's been a great help. And uh, so my great grandmother always said, and now she used the Cherokee word, she called him Nunyunui. That's, that's the Cherokee word for Bigfoot. She always said that the protected us. That and they protected us from something. And she she was scared to use the word. She wouldn't say it in a house. We had to be out in an open area, away from any and and couldn't be tall grass. Had to be short grass. Nothing out there that anybody could hide in. And, and she would get us all real close and she would hunker down and she would whisper it. But, but she said they protected us from something she called the Kekla Kudla. And she said they're, they're evil creatures that live further back in the woods in caves and stuff like that. You know, way further back in the, in the boonies. But that the, that the Nunyui, the Bigfoot, they, they protect us from them. Now, so digging around and talking to various people, I have heard that story, you know, from calling them different things, but, uh, you know, but describing that Bigfoot protect us from other things. Well, I got to digging into, well, what are these other things? And the key is in that scripture right there, the beasts of the earth. And I got to digging around and digging back into that, into that scripture, as well as some other references to the beast of the earth. And um, basically what it boils down to is these uh, other beings that live in the deep in the earth and um, like things like skinwalkers, vampires, rakes, crawlers, wendigos, Tommy knockers, deer wooking, stragoi, and these pale white bloodthirsty things, you know, is, is, is a sort of a common denominator of them. But now I'm wondering if, if they respond. You know, I, I I still don't know exactly why they come to to the voice of God. I don't know if it's uh, if there's the thing on hearts because we know in the end times that the very first big 
uh, big battles and everything, and is going to are going to wipe out a somewhere around a quarter to a third of the population of the Earth. And I don't know if uh, if they're expecting, you know, when they when the Bigfoot come in, if they're expecting an angel or somebody say, hey, these guys are we're fixing to release all these guys that are being hidden in the bowels of the earth all this time. And you got to help us protect these folks. You know, I don't know if that's it. I don't know. Um, but it's something that it's all something I know is daily, you know, so how again, often do you think they hear that horn blow? I mean, other than you, you blowing, how many other people do you know that have no. a, a kudu so you know what I mean? So far and out there blowing it in the woods. Out there, like, I guarantee you there's, I guarantee you they're probably worldwide. Uh, I want a guy I talked to up in New York. I know he has one and he knows how to blow it. I don't know if he ever has or not, but I bet you there's probably less than four or five in the whole face of the earth that have ever blown one of them out in the boonies. Just guessing. Very interesting. Uh, probably very interesting. How you tied it yeah. all together, how you weaved it all together. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, obviously. You did your research. Oh. It, it, trial and error. It's over 15, 15, I'm 15 years in this. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, like I said, we, we, were, we were studying the yeah, there was like three of us been studying this shofar, you know, for years, you know, for a, over a decade before anybody else heard about it. So, yeah, uh, I think it's very, very interesting. Know, it, it got my interest, yeah. piqued my interest right away when you told me the story. So, um, yeah, we're gonna open up some questions for uh, Tim here uh, in all caps, uh, if you got any. Um, we're almost up at the hour mark now, and uh, Spencer keeps on chiming in there, saying that we can't do it. Tim, well, we're going to go over a little bit, anyways. It does. We're not going to do the exact hour, um, but uh, yeah. I would love to have you back for a tape show one time and talk about this in extent. And you know, I don't care if it goes three or four hours. We'll tape it, and then I'll put it out for everybody to hear if you're interested in that. Yeah, I'll be glad to do that. Yeah, I would love to do that. I think it's it's very interesting to me that the the coyote story was crazy and coming out of the woods when the I told you the story up here that when I played that certain I won't get into it either that certain tone here, three of them came in too. There was yeah. what's with the threes? Is there something with three? Have you figured anything out on the threes? I don't know. I don't know. We actually had a one time in Oklahoma we had 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 them come from four directions. But we've had them come from only one direction before. I mean, it's basically if they were within within earshot of it, they're going to come. And it's if I, you know, if you had been in a place where there was a, a lot of them in there, and and probably five or six unit family units heard it. I think every, they'd all come. But we've had them. Uh, now one of the things that we found out and and got a couple of people here in here, uh, Jimmy and, and, and Mary that were there when this happened, where I'd been out there messing with it for 20 minutes, trying to hit the right notes. And I finally was able to do the right note for about a second, second and a half at the most. And immediately uh, we were across a 40 acre field. We were in the corner or the South edge of a 40 acre field, right over in the tree line to the North, which is 440 yards they cut loose screaming back. And uh, uh, my buddy uh, Dave is in here also. And uh, he uh, he had a really good thermal with him. And, um, and he was able to pick up. There were two of them, and they split. One was going around the – came, you know, took off and ran down the hedgerow and was coming down the east side of the field. And there was another one dropped off into a creek that was on the west side. and um, and he was coming down and they came and this time it was just two of them, but one of them came around the one that was come down the east side worked his way till he got around behind us and eased up till he could see us. And then the other one got down to the club and was looking up over the creek bank at us. 
And yes, I have research in Maryland, in Western Maryland, and a little bit on the Dunbar Peninsula. So, um, and there are boogers, there are boogers definitely in Western Maryland, absolutely positively. Um, okay. So and get to I want to thank Abby Howes sign. Uh, no, I have not found sign in their state of research. Um, I wore Vaughn and never found anything. <laughs> I found stuff in, in uh, upstate New York. I found some up in, the, in um, uh, um, New Hampshire. And I never found a visible sign, but I had my calls answered in, uh, in Maine. Um, and uh, out over there at uh, Baxter State Park. Um, hey Tim, can you try uh, coming, cutting in, and coming back again? You're breaking all up. Uh, how about now? Am I still breaking up? How about yeah? Am I okay now? Yeah, you're you're okay. It's okay. Yeah, I'm I'm dropping. Uh, let me uh, hang on just a second. Let me be right back. I turned off the HVAC. It's right behind me, and I was wondering if that motor turning on is doing something to my phone signal. Um. Okay, how about now? Am I? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, can hear you better well, now. Well, yeah. the thing hadn't kicked off. Yet. Okay. So we got a question here from um, uh, White S. Do you think the dogmen have the same function as the BF? Right. Um, I don't know. I used to think dog men were really evil and such. And, uh, but my, my opinion of them has changed as I've learned more about them. I'm still scared of them. Um, I think that they very well may. The reason being is because, um, the more I've studied them and, and, um, um, the more I've studied them and learned about them, the more that I find out that they that they are in the same territories together. And if they didn't get along in some way, they would have wiped each other out. Um, like I said, I know right here along the Tennessee River here, and um, there, I mean, we are there's I mean Bigfoot all over the place here, but we've got a high concentration of um. Uh, of dog men here as well. And, um, and these are the big dog men, uh, the big ones that are like, you know, 10 feet tall, 10, 11 feet tall. Um, I never had seen one until about, um, uh, about a year and a half ago. Well, now it's been two years. It was, it's, it's been almost two years ago that I saw my very first one. And it was about seven miles west of here. I mean, east of here, excuse me. But, um, but now I've been, I've been researching them and stuff, uh, um, for a while, for a lot longer than that. Do you think uh, they have a different, do, they, do you think they have a different temperament than the Bigfoot? I don't know. I used to think they did, but, um, I used to think they were more evil but in the um, if they wanted us dead, we'd be dead. If they were the if they were just completely bloodthirsty killers, you know, we wouldn't be here. I know that there have been you know there have been recorded instances, uh, especially in LBL and a few other places where they have killed people. But the same thing with Bigfoot. There's been recorded instances where we know that Bigfoot have killed people. But you know. People have killed people. So, but, uh, you know, if it was like, uh, what, was, what was the movie, The Purge? You know, if 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 the Bigfoot operated, you know, Bigfoot and 
Bigfoot and Dog Man, the only the only uh, you know, restraints that they have is, are the restraints that God built in, you know, our Heavenly Father built into them. And if they were totally evil, then you know they'd be tearing us to shreds all the time. Um, they um, um, so I I don't think that overall. I don't think that that maybe they're really any much more dangerous than, than Bigfoot, but I've seen um I've seen a number of really good photographs and I the one I saw was looking at me and it had a it had a very PO'd look in his face. I mean it was it's uh its ears were laid back and is is baring its teeth at me and his nose was wrinkled up, it was growling at me. But I'd slammed on the brakes and I'd stopped. I wasn't 10 feet from it, hardly. And um, it, uh, you know, it wasn't happy that I was there. Of course, you know, if I was trying to cross the road and somebody hit me with their high beams and then I backed off to let them go by and they slammed on the brakes and, you know, stopped right there by me with, you know, with my dead gum, you know, with my uh, fog lights, driving lights in their eye, in their face, you know, I might be, aggravated too True. but i i've seen i've also seen pictures that that uh the best picture i've ever seen of a of a, of a dog man's face and this is a picture that's totally disappeared and we we purposely to try to keep this from happening we disseminated it far and wide uh back when the alabama bigfoot research forum was out there mike mclean very purposely disseminated that uh, many, many, many copies of this picture. And this was a picture that Dallas Gilbert took up in Ohio. And Dallas used to send his, his, a lot of his film. This is back in the film days. He used to send a lot of his film to Jim Hart, my buddy, my, my friend, Bubba, Go, Bubba used to send it. And Bubba did, did, was doing a lot of photographic analysis back then. And he would send it to, to Bubba and Bubba would go through it and see what he could find. And um, in one of those pictures, there was a um, there was a dog man standing there under a tree, and in the shadows, it didn't really show up at first, but Bubba was able to enhance it, and it's standing there, and it's got its it's looking right into the camera, and it's such a good picture. You can see the pupils of its eyes. It's got its ears laid back. He's growling. You can see all four of his canines. His nose is wrinkled up. You can clearly see his nostrils, and you can see the big ruff of hair on his back. That's one thing that the big ones have a like a big mane on them. In fact, I've got a I've got an old German Shepherd just kind of like that. If you stood him up on two legs, he'd he'd look like a dog man. But uh, but he had a big old rough you know ruff of hair, big mane up on his shoulders, and um, but the thing about it is. Dallas had no idea it was there, none whatsoever. And uh, he sent, he shot, he was going up through a creek bottom and he started getting the heebie-jeebies and he just stopped and he, he panned and took five pictures. And he thought the he thought what whatever it was up there was over there in frame number four. And Bubba found the dog man in frame number two. So, um, so um, anyway, I, I had one. Go ahead. No, I said I still watch them guys. Uh, Go ahead. They still have videos out on YouTube. I, I really, uh, they they knew what they were doing for sure. Dallas, Dallas was a uh, before he had that before he had that incident where the booger grabbed him by the head. Dallas was an absolutely fantastic researcher. He was he was wonderful. But after that happened, he you know that affected him the rest of his life. But uh, he and old Keith were, were terrifically good researchers. As and, it would uh, anybody if they got grabbed uh, by I the head. Thought... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so Tim, we're, we've, we've, yeah. we've reached the hour mark. Um, you want to tell, do you want to give anybody any final thoughts before we head out? Well, um, I'm going to give you a little Bigfoot 101. And uh, any, any of you guys that have, 
haven't ever heard me talk before or um, or are wanting to get into more into Bigfoot researching, this is something my dad taught me from the time I was a little boy. And you need to uh, you need to apply it in the rest in your life anyway, no matter where you go. When you leave your driveway in your vehicle, when you go to park your car or your truck or whatever you're driving, you park that thing where it's pointed to the safe way out. So that if something happens, you can run and jump in your car and you can crank it up, slap it in gear and put her to the floor and get out of there fast. Unless you're parking in a place where you have to pull in, you know, diagonal parking or something. But you always park where you can get out in a hurry. And that includes if you can back into a parking place. But certainly anytime you're out in the woods, always, always, always park so that you can jump in your vehicle, crank it up, throw it in gear, mash it, put her to the floor, and you're headed to the, in the safe direction out. And, I mean, you don't know whether you're going to be running from wild dogs, wolves, coyotes, Bigfoot, uh, skinwalker, um, you know, meth heads, dr you know, a drug, uh, you know, drug dealers. I mean, you don't know what you're going to run into. Absolutely. You do not. And, um, but I didn't one time go in specifically to call up a booger. That was one that the only one I've ever encountered where you can call him up regularly in the daylight. And I didn't get my truck. I didn't turn my truck around. I really didn't expect anything. And it cost me a $700 dent repair job. The son of a gun showed up and he was right there near my truck. And I had, I jumped in my truck, took me about four jukes to get that big F-350 turned around. And I, excuse me, the F-250. And just as I was finally getting pointed out, he threw a big chunk of wood at my truck about five feet long, about as big around as my arm. And he hit the dead gum side of the, the, the bed of the truck right above the wheel well, put a big crease in it. I'd had that truck about two weeks. That made me feel real good and real intelligent. And uh, so I, had to, I paid 700 and something dollars to dent doctors in Tupelo, Mississippi to get the dent sucked out. <laughs> but Lesson learned, right? Lesson learned. <laughs> Is there uh, another there thing I'd... I'd Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go. Ahead. No, no. You say you. Is there anywhere what? Is there anywhere anybody can see your research? Do you have videos out there? Do you have like a, a website? Do you have a, a channel? Any anything like that they can go and look you up at? No. No. I well, I've done I've done a lot of stuff on YouTube. Done a lot of stuff on back on the old uh, old podcast on the old blog pod. Uh, with blog talk radio, I've done a lot of stuff back then. I've I've been doing stuff online, you know, shows like this since back in the uh, in the early two thousands on you know blog talk and stuff. And um, we used to have a I've I've been part of several different forums and stuff that we've had, and you know it's uh, my work's been wiped out multiple times. Um, um, I've lost. I one time in a two week period lost um, lost five hard drives and probably about six or eight thumb drives. And some of them were locked up in a, some of my thumb dr drives are locked up in a metal box. But um, uh, I've been, I've been threatened at work. I've been threatened to lose my job. Um, because I was, you know, getting too close to something, and uh, but, um, anyway, you can do, you can just do a Google search on me. Just do a search on Kumbo Bigfoot or Kumbo Baker Bigfoot or anything like that, and you'll find me. But um, but I uh, I have been putting trying to put together a book over the last few years. I've got I've got several chapters written. Um, one of the things I'll give you a little little uh, preview of one of the parts I I did a did a study that I, for over thirty years I studied a um, a section of some of the most prime habitat I've ever found anywhere in the country and it happens to be over in Mississippi and I and there was on this 
particular tract, there was, um, and we're, we're talking about an area that's about, uh, you know, 10 miles wide by 30 miles long. And there were six in that area. There were six troops of Bigfoot, six family units of Bigfoot lived in there. And I studied those for over 30 years. And I use that as my, as my standard area, my standard for comparing all of the habitat, all the rest of the habitat in the country against. And, um, and I know what the, I know what the carrying capacity of, I've sort of determined what the carrying capacity of that land is. And I spent a lot, a lot, lot of time compiling a lot of data and doing a lot of calling. I used, uh, and doing a lot of counting, I used the same methods and the same software, the Department of Interior and the Audubon Society and stuff like that, other groups, conservation groups use for uh, trying to determine the population of rare animals. You know, um, I, I use a software package called Presence, and I don't even know if that's still a, a current thing or not, but that's what I was using back in the, back in the, uh, uh, early 2000s and I used for used it for years but um, anyway um, through a lot of a lot of a lot of work and everything and, and I, I looked at every state and even the states that I hadn't hadn't re physically researched in I spent a lot of time pouring over maps and you know agricultural maps and land use maps and stuff you know land maps that I was able to come from the forest service and department of interior and stuff and determining the habitat and then i rated everything on a scale one to ten based at that 10 was this area there in mississippi and i estimated based on reports and sign and stuff about how many the um, Bigfoot they would be in each state. And I figured a very, very conservative estimate at the time was that the last time I compiled it all was about 64,000 of them around the country. But I actually think that it's, it's actually closer to about 100,000, that there's about 100,000 of them in the, in the United States. Um, and that's not counting Canada. Um, I, um, uh, but I spent a lot of time doing that. So I know that's that's a lot higher than a lot of people think. But um, you know, I haven't I haven't met um, anybody that's um, that's you know come up with anything any better. <laughs> And I would be re I'd be really glad to see if somebody had had come up with a better estimate and and how they did it, but I used the most scientific methods that I could come up with, and uh, but that's uh, and I was utterly I'll have to say I was utterly astounded when I I actually personally and I'm, I actually and well I knew they were there already because of talking to some of the people on the base, but first time I had to go to Edwards Air Force Base you know, with, with work. I was utterly astounded that there were buggers at Edwards Air Force Base. And that place is, is a, a moonscape. I mean, I was utterly astounded. And um, there weren't very many out there, but the uh, security people knew about them. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, I, found, uh, I, found, I found the right guy to talk to. But, um, I'll have to I'd have to agree with you. I think that there's 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 a lot there. Yeah, hundred thousand probably might even be a little little on the light side too. Who knows? I mean, they're 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 basically everywhere. You know, yeah, they they are everywhere, and the population is growing. I would guess now if I if I if I went back to that area, I haven't been down in Mississippi for uh, checking that area in the last probably five or six years, six or seven years, something like that. And um, I, um, I noticed that during the 30 years that I was doing this, um, this population study, 
that that the population was steadily growing in the areas that I frequented it around the country. You know, places in Texas and Oklahoma, and Mississippi and Alabama, Kentucky and Tennessee, and um, um, New Mexico, Arizona. Uh, you know, there's some of the those are some of the places I've researched in the most. And uh, and then talking to folks in other states, it was very obvious that the population nationwide is is growing, and I think that they're that they are recovering on, you know, when the unfortunate, the unfortunate fact is white men tried to wipe out the native Americans by infecting them with, um, you know, measles and chicken pox and smallpox and stuff like that. And, and they purposely infected the Buffalo herd with anthrax and humans can catch anthrax anthrax also. And I think the result of all that was that, uh, you know, it, it not only did it wipe out a huge, you know, probably untold hundreds of thousands of the Native Americans, but it wiped out untold hundreds of thousands of um, of of boogers of of Bigfoot, and probably also Dogman, and that's that's why the population is growing. And yeah, John Lamb, I said there, Mississippi is is packed full of boogers. In fact, there's not another state in the country that. That's uh, that has a density of boogers that, that Mississippi has that exceeds it. Now there's some that are equal to it, like maybe Alabama and and Louisiana and maybe part of Tennessee, part of Georgia, part of Florida, but overall Mississippi is just eat up with boogers. And um, but um, that uh, any other questions? <laughs> I think Jordan, that's that's gonna that's gonna wrap it up. It's very interesting, and I think the book. I, I look forward to the book, and I look forward to you coming back. And we're gonna do that recorded episode and uh, put it out for everybody so All they right. can really hear the in, the in depth stuff about what we went into on Saturday. So I want to say a big thanks to yeah. you tonight for stopping in on yes. a Monday night. I know it's the beginning of the week, and uh, everybody in the chat really appreciated you stopping by too. It was a great conversation. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, so, I'm proud of. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah. Well, we'll see you soon. We'll, we'll we're definitely going to be in touch. So, uh, if you hang backstage for a couple seconds, I uh, just want to say goodbye to everybody, and then I'll see you there. Ladies and gentlemen, Alrighty. Our guest, Mr. Tim Kumbo Baker. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. What a great show that was. Tim's a great guy. He is a wealth of knowledge. Um, we could sit here and talk for six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. Uh, great guy, uh, not afraid to share with people, and uh, I very appreciate the time that he's given us here at Discover Sasquatch in the last few days. Uh, next weekend, next week, our guest will be Mr. Spencer Jameson from Woodwalkers. He will be our guest next Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Please do not forget to like and subscribe. Become a member. Uh, there's special perks that are going to be coming out pretty soon, private shows. Maybe I'll even have a uh, we'll talk to Tim, and he can come back and do a private show with us uh, to the members. I think that would be a great idea. Um, so, yeah, next week is uh, is uh, Spencer Jameson. So, again, thank you all for keeping it cool in the, in, the, in the comment section and joining in, and I appreciate each and every one of you. And as my buddy Larry says, get in the woods, people. I'm trapped inside a fake reality. Better days will never.